Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's 9.30, so we'll get started. Um, like I mentioned a minute ago, this is a, it's a long chapter, and I'll take two lectures to finish this. Um, so we'll, the quiz on this chapter will be done next week, next Thursday, and that's when I'll open the exam, and it'll be due a week after that. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so in this chapter, we'll talk about temperature and heat. You all know that temperature is a measure of how hot an object is. Okay. And what this determines, what temperature determines is if this, if you bring two objects in contact, and if this object A is uh, hotter than object B, okay, what that tells you is which way heat will flow. Okay, so that's where the title comes from. So heat flows on its own from a hotter object to a colder object. Now, is there any way you can make heat flow the other way, from a colder object to a hotter object? Do you have anything in your life that does that? I'm sorry? Yeah, your refrigerator, very good. Okay. So what that does is, so inside your refrigerator, for instance, uh, the temperature is about four degrees Celsius. And outside in your kitchen, it's about 20 degrees Celsius. And yeah, the refrigerator is moving heat, Q is used for heat, is moving heat from the inside to the outside. But nature doesn't want to do that on its own, so you have to do work to do that. And your, your refrigerator is plugged to the wall, and the electric motor is doing the work. The instant you unplug this, that'll stop. Okay. So anyway, temperature determines which way heat will flow. Okay, now we'll give it a more technical uh, definition. So let me show you a little app here. Okay, what this shows you is a is a, is a certain amount of gas. So let me put more gas in there. Okay, and this shows you the pressure of the gas. That's quite a high pressure, 30 atmospheres. The gas is at 357 degree Kelvin. We'll talk about those Kelvin scales in a second. And you see all these gas molecules are moving about. Okay, now I'll warm the gas and watch what happens. So you saw the temperature rose. And what happened to the gas molecules? Started moving faster. They started moving faster. So temperature tells you the average kinetic energy of these gas molecules. Higher the temperature, higher the average kinetic energy. Okay. Now, all gas molecules are not moving at the same speed. So temperature is, me is a measure of the average kinetic energy per particle. Okay. That's what temperature measures. All right. So, so oh, by the way, so here's our favorite person, and <laughs> the quote is, Religious, religion is a culture of faith, science is a culture of doubt. You doubt everything till you, till you verify experimentally it's true. Yeah. So temperature is a measure of how hot an object is. It is a measure of average internal random kinetic energy of per particle of the system. Okay. So it's a measure of average internal internal kinetic energy per particle. So for instance, what we mean by internal is okay, so this object has a temperature. Okay, that's a measure of the random internal kinetic energy. If I move this object, that kinetic energy doesn't affect the temperature. Okay, do you guys understand that? So it's a measure of the internal energy. Okay. So the temperature of an object uniquely determines whether thermal energy will 
flow into or out of the substance. Okay, so you saw that um, okay, this number uniquely determines whether heat will flow into the subject or uh, into the object or out of the object. So if this object is in contact with a lower temperature object, you lose heat. Okay. And you know, this kind of stuff is con of concern to us because we are warm-blooded animals. We want to maintain a constant body temperature. And you'll see an example very shortly of uh, this phenomenon. Okay. Okay, here's a, just a pretty number. When the universe first began 13.8 billion years ago, the temperature during the Big Bang was about 10 to the 39 Kelvin. Okay. Today, we are bathed in a radiation whose temperature is 2.72 Kelvin. Yeah. And we'll come to the Kelvin scale in a second. All right, thermal contact. What does that mean to you guys? What does thermal contact mean? What thermal contact means is if you're in thermal contact with some object, you can exchange heat with it. All right, uh, are you ther in thermal contact with anything? Are you in thermal contact with anything? <laughs> I don't think so. You didn't think so? You're in thermal contact with everything in this room. Okay. This coffee cup is in thermal contact with the table. This coffee cup is in thermal contact with the wall. Well, what does thermal contact mean? It can exchange heat. How can this guy exchange heat with the walls? We, uh, go ahead. Well, no, we electromagnetic radiation. Okay, that's what those no no touch thermometers do. They're not touching you. How how the heck are they measuring your term temperature, right? They're exchanging electromagnetic radiation. Now, there's this there's a, something called the strength of thermal contact. This guy is in strong thermal contact with, with the table, but the thermal contact with the walls is weaker. Okay. But thermal contact is if you can exchange heat, and we'll see three mechanisms of exchanging heat. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay, so we'll um, see all those, those three things. So here are the three ways that you can exchange heat with other objects, conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay. So energy can be exchanged via conduction, convection, or radiation. Okay. Thermal equilibrium. Okay. So two objects are in thermal equilibrium when there is no net exchange of heat. That is, the amount of heat given up is equal to the amount of heat received. Okay. So Thermal equilibrium doesn't mean that you're not exchanging heat. There's no net exchange of heat. Okay. And that happens if you're at the same temperature. Okay. So if two objects are at the same temperature, they'll be in thermal equilibrium. Again, okay. there won't be any net exchange of heat. All right. So now uh, let me um, Most people, when they find out about this, this is they, they're kind of surprised. Okay, so you're all sitting on chairs. Um, touch the metal frame of the chair. Everybody, touch the metal frame of the chair. Okay. Now touch the table. Which one is, which one is hotter? Table. Okay. None of you guys are good thermometers. They're both exactly the same temperature. So why does it feel different? So, yes, so why does it feel different? So why does the frame feel colder? Okay. So you guys all have manufacturing defects. You're not good thermometers. What's going on? Is it the material it's made of? No, they're exactly the same temperature. I asked you what the temperature was. What's that? I'm sorry? So we are not good thermometers. What we are good at is, what concerns us is the rate of heat loss. So what you're 
more sensitive to it when you touch the frame, you're losing heat faster, and that feels colder. Here, you're not losing heat as fast, so it doesn't feel as cold. And that, that's what concerns us. Okay. Why, why are we concerned of heat loss more, faster heat loss? Because we want to maintain a body temperature, a constant body temperature. Okay. We don't want to lose heat. And so that's what we're more sensitive to. And that's what this thing says. Okay. So humans are, to a large degree, sensitive to L energy fluxes, okay, rate of heat loss, rather, rather than temperature. Okay. Rate of heat loss is more concerning to us than the temperature. It can be any temperature it wants. As long as you're not heat, losing heat or you're not gaining heat, you're, you, it wouldn't bother you. Okay which you can verify for yourself on a cold, dark morning in the outhouse of a mountain cabin equipped with wooden and metal toilet seats. Both seats are, ex are, are at exactly the same temperature, but your backside, which is not a very good thermometer, is nevertheless very effective at telling you which is which. Yeah. All right, so we are sensitive to energy fluxes. Okay we are less concerned with the temperature. Yeah. All right, uh, so you've learned that temperature measures how hot an object is. Again, that, tells you, that tells you what is the average kinetic energy per particle. Okay. Now, but we need to measure the temperature of objects. So we have these three temperature scales, Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin that are used, uh, that are used commonly. Now, to build a temperature scale, okay, um, by the way, so the Celsius scale, uh, okay, we'll come to that. So to build, build a temperature scale, what you need is two phenomena, two physical phenomena. So for instance, ice will melt at the same temperature, okay, so this is at one atmosphere, ice will melt at the same temperature, whether you melt ice now, in the middle of the night, um, 10 years from now, whatever. Whenever you melt ice and you put your finger, it feels the same temperature. Yep. You boil water at one atmosphere, it doesn't matter when you boil it, it feels the same temperature. It's the same temperature. Okay. So here are two physical phenomena that happen at the same temperature, no matter when you do it. And so to build a temperature scale, you can call this anything you want. You call that a bigger number because it's warmer. Yep. So in principle, you can make an infinite number of temperature scales. Yep. Did you guys understand that? Okay. So the Celsius scale people call that zero degree Celsius. They call that 100 degrees Celsius. The Fahrenheit people call the same temperature 32 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit, 212 degree Fahrenheit. Okay, the Kelvin people call this 273 degree Kelvin, and that thing 373 degree Kelvin. All right, so now let's notice a couple of things about this. Okay. So between these two temperatures, there's 100 degrees on the Celsius scale. Between these two temperatures, there's 180 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. So there's more degrees here, so this scale is more sensitive. Okay. Uh, so it's a finer scale, and that's what we use to measure our body temperatures and stuff like that. Okay. Look at this guy. How many degrees are there between these two temperatures on this scale? I'm sorry? 100 degrees. I mean, so why have this it's sort of redundant? So this scale and this scale have the same sensitivity. So why did we come up with this scale? All right, so now let's answer that question. Do you guys understand? Yes, let's answer that question. Okay. So what did temperature measure? The average kinetic energy per particle. Okay, so let's cool, cool this down. 
see I'm I'm reducing the temperature as I'm cooling them down. And what is happening to the molecules? They are slowing up. What is the best you could do? How far can you cool cool that gas? Zero. Absolutely zero. Until all the molecules stop. That's all you can do. That's the best you can do. Okay. And at what temperature does do all the molecules stop? On this scale, they stop at minus two seventy three degree Celsius. Yeah, that's a very odd temperature, <laughs> right? You tell your little brother or somebody, hey, the coldest temperature is minus two seventy three degrees Celsius. That's a very odd number. So you just reinvent a new scale. On this scale, that's zero. So this is the Kelvin scale is exactly the same as the Celsius scale. The zero has just been moved. Okay. So on the Kelvin scale, the zero degrees Kelvin is the coldest temperature. That's all. Okay. So the Kelvin scale is the Celsius scale with the zero moved. Okay. So absolute zero, and we'll come to that in a second. So absolute zero is the temp lowest possible temperature, and the absolute zero is, the is zero degree Kelvin. And at absolute zero, all molecular motion ceases. Cease. Okay, so absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature. A sample cannot be cooled to zero degree Kelvin, although one can come very close to it. Okay, so you can actually never reach absolute zero. Okay, you can only come close to it. In fact, um, we are fairly close to the University of Florida, and so you have in in the University of Florida and in many other universities, they'll so they have these doers. Um, that are about twice as tall as this. So this thing is about twice as tall as this and from here to the wall, that big. And in there, they'll cool little samples like this to nano Kelvin. Okay. So they will cool a sample like that to that close to absolute zero. I mean, there are several labs in the world that will do it. But think of that. Just 100 miles from here, here's an object that has been cooled to this temperature, and that probably is the coldest temperature in the universe. Right? Pretty neat. And in fact, you know, they have to isolate these things from the ground, because if a truck drives by here, the vibrations would wa warm the sample. So this is pretty neat technology. Yep. Do you know how cold uh, dry ice is? I'm sorry? Do you know how cold dry ice is? Uh, I think it's minus 70 degrees Celsius or something like that. Uh, Google. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature. Okay, And uh, this is minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so we... Um, we, that's why we invented the Kelvin scale. We call this zero degree Kelvin. And um, one, the size of one degree Kelvin is the same as the size of uh, one degree Celsius. Okay, and this is how we found uh, absolute zero. Okay, so you take um, three flasks, fill different amounts of gas, gases in them. Uh, you can do that at any, any temperature. So let's say at 100 degrees Celsius, you have different amounts of gas in three flasks. It's the same size flask, and the pressure will be dif different. The pressure is highest where the gas is the most, and so on. And then you start cooling these gases, and they all the pressure all goes to zero at the same temperature. And the pressure goes to zero when all the molecules have stopped. Okay, and that's what uh, that's how we discovered absolute zero. All right, coming back to this slide, what this slide shows you ha is how to convert temperatures from one scale to another, okay? So what this formula does is it lets you convert a temperature on the Celsius scale to the Fahrenheit scale. And this formula lets you convert a temperature in the Celsius scale to Kelvin scale, okay? 
And between these two, you can go from any temperature scale to any other temperature scale, okay? So for instance, if you had 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So to convert that to Fahrenheit, multiplied by 9 fifth, multiplied by 9 fifth, and add 32 to it, I guess. So that's 4, 36, and 32 is 68 degree Fahrenheit. Okay, so 20 degrees Celsius is 68 degree Fahrenheit. Okay, a quick way to do this is to remember, a quick way to do this, see, this is roughly two. So whatever the Celsius scale, multiply that by two and add 30 to it, okay? So if you had 30 degrees Celsius, multiply that by two, that's 60, 60 plus 30 is 90 degree Fahrenheit. And Celsius to Kelvin is, you just add 273 degrees to it. <coughs> so at absolute zero, all molecular motion ceases and internal energy of the system is zero. All right, uh, so now uh, we'll learn a important thing and we'll see how those no touch thermometers work, okay? So here are some temperatures we have measured. Okay. So here is a hydrogen bomb. At the center of a hydrogen bomb explosion, the temperature is 100 million degree Kelvin. Okay. Okay. So here is the explosion. At the center of the explosion, the temperature is 100 million degree Kelvin. Here is the sun. At the center of the sun, the temperature is about 15.6 million degree Kelvin. All right, so notice this. At the center of a hydrogen bomb explosion, the temperature is higher than the temperature at the center of the sun. All right, so here's the question to you guys. It's how do we know the temperature of the, ex ex the temperature at the center of the explosion? Did somebody stick their fingers there? All right. So how do we measure those temperatures? So here's how we do this. Okay, so every object, so watch the temperature. Every object, I'm changing the temperature emits electromagnetic radiation. And what this curve is showing you is, what this curve is telling you is, this curve is telling you, this is the intensity of the radiation, and this is the wavelength of the radiation. Wavelength of the radiation is related to the color of the radiation. So what this is saying is, at this wavelength, that is the intensity, at this wavelength, that is the intensity, at this wavelength, that is the intensity, okay? And notice, as I t change the temperature of the object, the curve changes. The curve is unique for every temperature, okay? So every object is emitting electromagnetic radiation, okay? So he's uh, emitting electromagnetic radiation and the intensity for different colors that he emits is a unique curve. The walls are emitting electromagnetic radiation. So I want to measure the temperature of the wall. I ha all I have to do is measure ra the intensity of the radiation of different colors coming from it, okay? I measure this intensity, I measure this intensity, I measure this intensity, and I know what curves fit that, and I know the temperature, okay? And that's how those no-touch thermometers work, okay? So they're measuring intensity for several wavelengths, and they know what curve fits it, and that they can tell the temperature. So that's how you measure the temperature of all remote objects. So that's how we know the surface temperature of the sun, and so on. So this is the surface temperature of the sun, by the way. Okay. Okay. So 5800 degree Kelvin. Okay. So we are measuring the radiation. 
That's how we know the temperature of the atmosphere of various planets and stuff like that. Okay? If you don't want to touch anything, that you want to know the temperature inside a furnace, this is how we do it. Okay? All right, so this is called a black body spectrum. Okay? Um, all right, so... Um, so again, this lists various temperatures. All right, here's a solid object. Here's a model of a solid. Um, in a solid object, so in a metal, for instance, here are these atoms. They're in fixed locations, okay? And they're held in their position by the forces between other atoms, so you, which are modeled by springs. So, okay, if this atom wants to run away, this guy is pulling him back using the spring. So that's, you can think of it that way. And if this guy, if he wants to run away, that guy will push him back in place and all, so on. Okay, so these are the, this is the model. And um, so what does temperature measure? Temperature measures the average kinetic energy. So at any temperature, these guys are, even though they're fixed, they're vibrating about their equilibrium position. You heat a metal, they vibrate with a larger amplitude and their energy increases, okay? And you heat a metal, their energy will increase. Another thing that will happen is they will move further apart. So the strings will, springs will stretch. That is, you're adding potential energy to the springs, energy to the springs, and they stretch. Okay? So you heat a metal, every atom will go further apart. Okay? And when every atom goes further apart, see the metal expands. Okay. So, when you increase the temperature, the length of this metal rod will increase. And this formula gives you the increase in length. That's the increase in length. Depends on the original length. The, long, the longer the rod was, the more it'll increase in length. That's the rise in temperature. And this is a number alpha that depends, that, um, that depends on the material. Okay. So alpha is called the coefficient of linear expansion. Okay. Now these guys are important enough that uh, we have tables for them. So for aluminum, the linear expansion is uh, 25 times 10 to the minus 6. What this, that's, uh, that's a very small number. And what this number amounts to is for one degree rise in temperature, the length will increase 25 parts in a million. Okay, so if you have a one meter rod, aluminum rod, okay, so delta L is L times um, delta T times alpha. So for aluminum, if you have one meter and the rise in temperature is one degree Celsius, alpha is 25 times 10 to the minus six. So it'll 25 times 10 to the minus six meters you don't have to know all these calculations, which is 10 minus 3 millimeters, which is 0 0.025 millimeter. Okay. So a one, so a one meter. This is one meter. A one meter aluminum rod. If you raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, its temp, it will, its length will increase that. Okay. But this stuff is important, and it concerns us, and so we have to account for this. So here's an example. Okay. So here's a bridge in Michigan, and it's uh, a kilometer long. So it's from here to almost a mile long. Okay. Uh, you guys know what a mile is. It's, um, and so between the dead of winter and the peak of summer, it sees a 100 degree temperature change. Okay, so it sees that much of a change. So this bridge will expand. And so you have to account for that and accommodate for that. And if you don't, the spans would push against each other and the bridge, bridge would crumble. Okay, and so between spans, they leave these gaps. These are expansion gaps. I don't know if you guys have walked across a bridge, but you can see this for yourself. Okay. Every bridge will have this. 
And so this is how it is in the winter. And you see, in the summer, the spans have expanded and the gaps have closed. Okay? So there's barely enough gaps here. So every bridge will have an expansion gap. Have you guys seen this anywhere else? When you walk on the sidewalk, you see those cuts? Those are expansion gaps. Okay. All right. So, so on this bridge, all those expansion gaps add up to 1.5 meters. 1.5 meters is my height. So all these little gaps on that bridge add up to 1.5 meters. Yeah. Train tracks have those expansion gaps. So there's one rail and there's another rail and so on. Okay, so you have all these expansion gaps. Now here's a, so, so look at this track. That gap was not, not enough gap was left and the rails pushed against each other and they deform. And this, you can't go on that, you'll derail. Okay. So those expansion gaps have to be pro provided. Okay. Uh, by the way, the Trans-Siberian line goes 10,000 kilometers across Asia, about twice the distance from New York to San Francisco. And the, these expansion gaps add up to eight kilometers. Eight kilometers is from Daytona to Ormond Beach. Eight kilometers is five miles about from here to the exit. Okay. So that's how much. Uh, okay. <clears throat> All right, now we'll uh, define what heat is. You guys know what heat, uh, you know, we have a sense for it when you have two objects in contact that are different temperature, heat flows from the hotter object to the cold object, okay? It's a form of energy, okay? Now we'll see exactly what kind of energy it is, okay? So here's this model of the solid. If I heat the solid, what will happen? Okay, so these guys will vibrate with a larger amplitude. Their kinetic energy increases, and they expand. You're putting some energy in the spring, so it takes energy to stretch a spring. So you're increasing the potential energy. Okay, so this is kinetic energy, and that is spring potential energy. Okay, so an object at a hotter temperature has higher kinetic energy and potential energy per particle. And when heat flows, it's that energy that flows. And as heat flows from here to there, these uh, vibrations become smaller and these vibrations increase, okay? So, so let me go back, um, okay. So here's a model of a solid. This end of the solid is hotter than this end, okay? So these atoms are vibrating with a larger amplitude. They have more kinetic energy than these guys. They're further apart, they have more potential energy. And as heat flows from the hotter end to the colder end, they're sharing some of their energy with the neighbors, which are sharing more en energy from the neighbors. Okay, and that, so heat energy is the sum of kinetic, random kinetic and potential energy. That energy flows, okay. Till what time will heat flow? How long will heat flow from here to there? Till it's all the same temperature. So till everywhere in the solid, the average kinetic energy and potential energy per particle is the same, okay? So that is heat, okay? <clears throat> So heat is the internal energy transferred between objects because of temperature difference uh, between them. Internal energy or thermal energy of a system is the random internal kinetic and potential energies of the microscopic constituents of the system, which are the atoms, okay? Okay, heat, uh, so, 
back 300 years ago, we didn't realize that heat was a form of energy. It was the random internal kinetic energy and potential energy. We thought it was some kind of fluid and objects, but anyway. So back in the old days, heat was defined. Uh, the unit of heat was a calorie. Um, hello there. Can you hold up your bottle? Oh, can you hold up your bottle? Okay, so a cap full of that water is about one gram. To heat one gram of water by one, thank you, by one degree Celsius, that much water, to warm it by one degree Celsius, you need one calorie of heat. Okay. Now, you hear the term calorie all the time. A food calorie is uh, a thousand of those calories. Okay. So you will see a food calorie is written with a big C and is a little, is a thousand of those little calories. Okay. And the reason we do that is because uh, our friend here, if uh, yogurt says 80,000 calories, she wouldn't buy it. <laughs> so that's why. So we got to redefine a food calories. Okay. All right, so you guys know what a calorie is. It's the amount of heat needed to warm one gram of water by one degrees. Okay. Now, this is um, so a U SI unit for energy is a joule, and one calorie is 4.184 joules. Okay. Mr. Joule was the first one who, um, once we realized that heat was a form of energy, this had to be done and he did the experiment and found this number. And that's why we named the unit of energy Joule after Mr. Joule. Okay, here's, here was his experiment. Okay, you can see that when this uh, object, this weight falls, it uh, turns the paddle and it warms up the water, okay? So when this thing falls, the loss of its energy, potential energy can be calculated in Joules and when this water warms up, that can be calculated in calories, okay? So this is how he found the relationship between calories and joules, okay? So, and again, that's why we um, named the unit of energy after Mr. Joule. Yeah. Okay, so, Let's say you have a substance, a solid or a liquid, and you add heat to it. We use Q to represent heat, okay? Now, so the amount of heat added is equal to the mass of the object times the specific heat of the object times the rise in temperature, okay? This guy, specific heat depends on the material. Higher the specific heat, lower the rise in temperature for a given amount of heat. So higher the specific heat, lower the rise in temperature. Okay, that means, okay, so higher the specific heat, you can't change the temperature of that object too much. So, for instance, uh, water has a very high specific heat. Okay, the specific heat of water, one gram of water is uh, about seven times greater than the specific heat of land. Seven times greater. Okay, so you put the same amount of heat, the temperature of land will rise by about seven times as much. Did you guys understand that? So it's harder to change the temperature of a body of water. Okay. So that is the reason why waterfront property is expensive. Okay. because the climate around a waterfront property is always moderate. You're not changing the temperature of a lake too much or that of an ocean. Okay. In addition, here's another fact. If you live next to a body of water, there's always a breeze. Okay. And let's see that. Okay. All right, so um, again, so this formula tells you, so this is the specific heat of an object. The specific heat, so if you rearrange this, specific heat is Q over M divided by T. So the specific heat tells you how much heat you need to add 
to raise the temperature of 1 kg of the object by 1 degree Celsius. Okay? That's what this tells you. So this is for solids and liquids. It turns out that gases, it's easier to measure how many moles of a gas you have. So we define molar specific heat for gases. Okay? So solids and liquids, you can measure the mass. Gases, you want to measure the number of moles you have. So that's why we de define that. Okay, so let me show you some numbers. So the specific heat for water is 4,200, 4,186 joules per kg per Kelvin. And for silicon, uh, land, dirt is uh, silicon dioxide mostly. It's about 700 joules per kg per Kelvin. So you see this, the specific heat of water is six times greater than that. Okay. It's six times harder to change the temperature of water than of land. Okay. So now let's uh, come to this diagram. Okay. So what we're going to do is during the day, so, so it's daytime, the sun is shining, and the sun is, uh, you know, it's uh, very democratic. It sh deposits equal amount of energy in both land and the ocean. Yeah. You saw that the amount of heat added is the same. If you have the same amount of material, the specific heat of water is six times greater. Its temperature rise will be less. Okay, So this thing is hot and this thing is, this body is cold. You added the same amount of heat, but the temperature change was different because the specific heat is uh, different, okay? All right, during the day, land got hotter. What happens? The air around it gets warmer. Warm air expands, and it rises up, okay? So it's leaving a lower pressure here. So during the day, this air is rising. It leaves a lower pressure. There's a higher pressure here, and this higher pressure blows a breeze in that direction. So during the day, you'll have a breeze blowing from the water toward land. Okay. At night, what happens? So the, the land, its uh, heat content is not that large. It cools faster. So at night, this becomes colder and this is still warm because water has a lot of heat content and it doesn't lose its temp heat fast. Okay. So now this is hotter, this air expands, it rises, and then breeze blows from there to there. This is at a higher pressure and this is at a lower pressure. Okay. So that's why if you have this pr property, okay, you always have a breeze, and you're next to a object, large object whose temperature doesn't change much. Okay. okay so you always are at, you always have moderate weather at, next to a large body of water. Okay. And by the way, you go in five, five kilometer or five miles inland and the temperature difference is uh, about five degrees. Okay. And you don't have the effect of the breeze. Okay. okay, so this is a slightly longer story, but um, an interesting story. Okay. So let's say here is a object, okay. and by the way, density, the density is denoted by rho, this symbol is rho, okay. it's the mass per unit volume, and this is a property of the material, um, so for pure substances, that can be a characterizing property, okay. density is mass divided by volume. All right, so here is a object, Let's uh, heat it. Okay. So when you heat it, when you raise the temperature of an object, what happens to this object? Will it expand? When you raise the temperature of an object, it expands, right? Most objects expand. The volume would increase. And if the volume increases, the mass doesn't change, that doesn't change, but if the volume increases, the density will decrease. 
Everybody understand that? So for most objects, if you increase the temperature, the density decreases. All right, let's look at this. This is the density for fresh water. And look at this. For temperatures from 0 to 4 degrees Celsius, you're raising the temperature, but the density is increasing. So water is strange. Okay. This is a very small effect. So this is, uh, you know, about 10 parts in uh, 10 parts in uh, 100,000. It's a very small effect, okay? but the density nevertheless is increasing. And after four degrees, it, uh, water behaves normally. You increase the temperature and the density drops. Yep. But this fact is important. It's important for life, and we'll see how. And another feature of uh, water is when you freeze water, its density decreases. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, um, okay, so let's uh, look at why that is important. All right, um, do you guys know how to freeze a lake? Can anybody freeze a lake? How do you freeze a lake? All right, so let me show you how to freeze a lake. Okay. In case if you ever have to do that. Yeah. So let's say you want to freeze the lake in your backyard. <laughs> What's that? So. All right. <laughs> hey, you've already paid money for this course. You might as well learn something, right? <laughs> What you do is, uh, you want to freeze a lake, all you do is flip a switch and turn the air temperature low. <laughs> okay, let's say your lake was at 10 degrees Celsius. And uh, the reason you turn the air temperature low is now heat can flow from here to there. Yeah. You want to freeze a lake, you have to remove heat from the water. Okay, and uh, I'll We'll, in a couple of minutes, we'll learn this, but um, to freeze one gram of water, you know what one gram of water is, you have to remove 80 calories of heat. Okay. All right, so you're removing heat, and this thing, uh, so this got colder, the water got colder, and let's say the top layer got to four degrees Celsius. What happened at four degrees Celsius? You, oops, where is, at four degrees Celsius, the water became dense. It's the densest at four degrees Celsius, okay? Denser materials will sink, so this water will sink to the bottom. Okay. Now, eventually, the entire lake gets to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. This layer is at 4, 4, and that layer is 4. Well, heat is still flowing out because this air is, you know, this air is still cold. Okay. This will become, so this will get cold. It will become 2 degrees Celsius. But at 2 degrees Celsius, it's less dense. This water won't sink anymore. Okay. Heat still flows. This thing will go to zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, it's still less dense. It's not sinking. Okay. Heat still flows, and eventually this freezes. And ice is lighter than water, so it won't sink. And now, this blanket of ice cuts down heat loss okay so if you're trying to freeze a leak uh, a lake all you did was fr froze the top layer and now this guy is won't freeze okay so you turned on the switch and all you spent all that money and all you did was you froze the top layer of the lake we asked you to do a simple task
and all you did was freeze a top layer a few feet thick. Well, this is very important because you see through the winter now, fish can survive. So this is important for life. Yep. And uh, so we are very thankful for this little bump in the curve. Okay. See, most materials, if you raise the temperature, the density lowers. But in this small window, water is very special. You raise the temperature, and instead of the density falling, it rose. And again, like I said, it's only a very small effect, 10 parts in 100,000. But this was crucial for life. Okay. And after 4 degrees, it's still behaving normally, and we don't care about that. Yeah. So this was important. All right. Uh, Now, uh, we'll learn another important fact for us. Okay. You guys um, uh, <clears throat> know that um, we are warm-blooded animals. We maintain constant body temperature. And if you produce excess heat, how do you get rid of the excess heat from your body? Sweat. You sweat. OK. Now, so you sweat. That's not good enough. What you want is for the sweat to evaporate. And every time one gram of sweat evaporates, it takes away 540 calories of heat. That's a large amount of heat. All right, so you sweat, and what you hope, you, what you do is after you sweat, you hope like hell that the sweat evaporates. When would the sweat not evaporate? Would the sweat evaporate all the time? Is there any? High humidity. High humidity. If there's 100% humidity, sweat won't evaporate. OK. So why, why doesn't sweat evaporate uh, at a high, high humidity? At 100%. At any temperature, the atmosphere can hold only so much water. Once it's reached saturation point, no more sweat can evaporate. Okay, and so you couldn't cool down anymore. So uh, you have situations where, let's say, somebody is overheated. Let's say somebody's on the football field and overheated, and uh, the humidity is very high, and you got to cool down, cool them fast. I'm sorry. A what? Okay. So, what our friend said is, uh, do you wor work in the medical field? OK. So if the humidity is 100%, so here's what is done. If the humidity is 100% and sweat won't evaporate anymore, what you do is you give them an alcohol rub. Why do you give them an alcohol rub? The al alcohol rub, I'm sorry? Yeah, the alcohol evaporates because it's 0% zero, zero humidity as far as alcohol is concerned. And alcohol will evaporate. Okay. The only problem is one gram of alcohol, when it evaporates, it only takes about 204 calories of heat. Okay. So that's why we don't sweat alcohol and we sweat water. Okay. This, it's more efficient. Okay. But that's what you would do. Okay. You, when stuff evaporates, it takes away a lot of heat. Okay. All right. We'll learn all of that. So I'll uh, we'll, I'll show you a problem where how much sweat needs, uh, how much alcohol rub you need to give. Okay. All right. Uh, so first, let's understand the concept of latent heat. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go into our fridge and get a bunch of ice. Okay. Now, the ice from your fridge is at a minus 5 degrees Celsius. Again, we're going to put it on the stove and add heat to it. Okay. What will happen? I'm sorry? And so it will start melting. OK, none of it melts. What happens is the temperature will rise up to 0 degrees Celsius. Okay. And then 
ice starts melting. Okay. So, and once ice starts melting, the temperature is not rising. The temperature remains at zero degrees Celsius. So where's all the heat going? You're adding heat to the substance and the temperature is not rising. Okay, so it's, it's remember in ice, all the molecules are at the fixed loca location, so you're breaking the bonds, all the energy is going there. And that is called latent heat, okay? So when the heat is not uh, raising the temperature and it's going into changing the phase, okay? So it's changing uh, the phase of the substance. So you're, when you're melting, you're turning ice, from, uh, H2O from solid to liquid phase, okay? So during phase change, the heat added is, doesn't change the temperature and that's called latent heat, okay? So, um, during phase change, heat added, when latent heat is involved, does not raise the temperature of the substance. The latent heat is required to overcome intermolecular forces. So when you're going from solid to liquid, you're breaking these bonds and that's what's happening. And when you're evaporating a, a, a substance in a liquid, the molecules are closer and in a gas molecules, they're further apart. So you're breaking the attractive force bond, okay? So for instance, okay, for uh, water, okay, you take ice at, uh, let's say, minus 20 degrees Celsius, you add heat, and the temperature will rise, and then you keep adding heat, and while it's melting, the temperature remains constant, okay? So, um, so the heat added is called the latent heat, and once all the ice is melted, you can raise the temperature of the water again, okay? So anytime you see an ice water mixture, you, you know for sure it's at zero degrees Celsius. Okay? So every time you see, um, you go to a restaurant and you, have a, you see a glass of ice and water, okay? that's at zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. Okay? That mixture is at zero degrees Celsius. Okay? And once you get the water at 100 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, you keep adding heat and the temperature doesn't rise because uh, water is being converted to steam, and once all the water is being converted to steam, then you can raise the temperature of steam to anything you want. Okay. These are important numbers to remember. The heat of fusion of water, okay, so it's the latent heat. It's written with a subscript F sometimes, F indicating fusion for water. Okay, so this, these are numbers for water is 80 calories per gram. What that number means is to melt one gram of ice, you need 80 calories of heat. Conversely, if you want to freeze one gram of water, you have to remove 80 calories of heat. Okay. The heat of vaporization of water is 540 calories per gram. Okay. So, that is written with a subscript V for vaporization is 540 calories per gram, okay? So when one gram of water turns to steam, what you have to do is it takes, it takes away 540 calories of heat, okay? And conversely, if one gram of steam converts to water, it dumps 540 calories of heat. Okay, so uh, people in the medical industry know this. Um, what would you have rather done to you? One gram of water at 100 degrees Celsius or one gram of steam at 100 degrees Celsius? What would you have rather thrown at you? Neither, of course, but <laughs> if you had to choose. They're at the same temperature. What would you rather have done at you? Okay, so if, if somebody dumps one gram of steam at you, when the steam condenses to water at 100 degrees Celsius, it's dumped 
540 calories of heat at you. And then still you still have 100 water at 100 degrees, which will burn just like that. So steam has that much extra energy. Steam burns, uh, they are bad news. Okay. So if you talk to firefighters and stuff like that, you don't want a steam burn. Okay. All right, so the heat of vaporization of water is quite large. It is the energy source for hurricanes and steam burns. Okay. Um, I'll tell you about hurricanes briefly because we live in Florida. Okay. So you've learned how to freeze a lake. Now we'll learn how to make a hurricane. <laughs> what you need is a warm body of water. Let's say, we'll say 20 degrees Celsius. And water evaporates. When water evaporates to, to vaporize one gram of water, how much heat did you need? 540 calories of heat. Okay, so this warm ocean provided that heat. Okay. So now this, this warm, uh, moisturized water is rises up and when it goes up it cools down and forms cloud cloud has become that water vapor has become water again so it's for every gram of water that's condensed it's let off 540 calories of heat so what did you end up doing you took heat from here and put it up there in the atmosphere and that energy is what powers the air moist air to spin okay. and only about one percent of that energy goes into spinning in the hurricane so okay so the process of vaporization and condensation transported heat from here to there okay. so you need warm waters for that again okay. burns produced by the condensation of 100 degrees steam on skin are more severe than those produced by the same mass of 100 degree water. So, yeah. So here's the latent heat of fusion and latent heat of vaporization for water and various other substances. This is in joules per kg. Okay, so these big numbers are hard to remember and uh, I find these numbers are the most useful to remember. 80 calories per gram is the latent heat of fusion of water and 540 calories per gram or latent heat of vaporization of water. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we'll talk about this one slide and then we'll stop. Okay, so here's a so let's say I take a glass of water and I set it on the table here. Will any water evaporate? So this water is at uh, so at room temperature. Let's say the room temperature in this in this room is twenty degrees Celsius. At what temperature does water boil? Hundred degrees Celsius. Okay, so I've Put a glass of water here. Will any water evaporate? Okay. It will evaporate. Okay, so just like uh, so, you saw that uh, uh, we saw this app. So you saw that in this gas, in this gas, all these molecules are vibrating, I mean, moving about randomly. And they have kinetic energy. They're all not moving at the same speed, by the way. So the gas in this room, each molecule is moving at, on the average at about half a kilometer a second, okay? Um, 
there are some fast molecules and some slow molecules just like that in this in this glass of water there's water molecules that are moving moving about randomly and the fast molecules are able to escape okay so there's evaporation happening well there's water molecules in the atmosphere which are also coming back but if the humidity is less than 100%, the number of molecules escaping is more than the number of molecules coming in. When the humidity is 100%, the number of molecules escaping is equal to the number of molecules coming in. Okay. How do you get rid of body heat again? Your sweat evaporates. Your sweat will not evaporate when, uh, when, um, when it, there's 100% humidity, okay? So for you to be comfortable, we maintain about 40 to 50% humidity, okay? And that costs money, by the way. Do you guys know how much money this school is spending a year on electricity? Anybody wanna take a guess? Mm-hmm, $5 million. No, 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 this, this is for the whole campus. Okay. okay, so if the humidity, so to make, keep you comfortable, the humidity is 40 to 50%. Okay. What if the humidity were lower? What if the humidity were 20%? It costs more money, but that's besides the point. What would happen? Evaporation would increase, right? Evaporation would increase. Moisture from your mucus and all would evaporate. All your mucus will get dry, and that's not good. Okay, so too low a humidity is not good, and too high a humidity is not good. Okay, so evaporation happens. Everybody understand that? So if there is low moisture in the air, evaporation will happen, and uh, the faster molecules are escaping, and molecules from the atmosphere are coming in as well. But if it's less than 100% humidity, there's net evaporation. At 100% humidity, there's no evaporation, and so on. Okay. All right, so water and other substances can evaporate at temperatures far below their um, boiling point. Okay. A glass of water will slowly evaporate away in a few days. Uh, ice can even sublimate directly to water vapor. Okay. So uh, ice cubes left in a freezer slowly disappear as water goes from solid state directly to gaseous state, okay. Okay. There are always molecules with kinetic energies far above the average. Those with large enough kinetic energies overcome the attractive force that hold them in a solid or liquid and escape. So the faster molecules will escape. Okay. Okay. So we'll define relative humidity. Okay, what this graph this table tells you is saturation density of water vapor in in uh, air. What that means is what is the maximum water that can be held in air at a given temperature. So there are the various temperatures. So in this room, the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. At 20 degrees Celsius, the maximum water that the atmosphere can hold is 17.3 grams per meter cube. Here's a meter cube. So this is a meter cube. In this much air, if you want 100% humidity, you would have to put 17.3 grams of water. 17.3 grams is about uh, two thirds of an ounce, about uh, half a mouthful of water. Okay, now if that much, so in this room, the humidity is about 50%. So how much water vapor, water vapor, water is there in the atmosphere? Uh, 8.65 grams right now per meter cube, okay? So if you have half the amount of water, half the maximum that can be held, the humidity is 50%, okay? So that's what relative humidity means. And it's an important number for us because it tells us, the, uh, you know, it's important for our comfort level, okay? So a relative humidity of 100% means the air is totally saturated and can hold no more water vapor. 
no more evaporation can occur and that's extremely important for us okay? your sweat will not evaporate and cool you down okay all right we'll stop here and uh, next